Russell Mackenzie. Russell farms 750 hectares in Cambridgeshire. Four units over 17 miles. An HDB monitor farmer. And Russell will be joining us on the board hopefully tomorrow. He'll be our new scholar representative on the board of trustees. So we're looking forward to uh, working with Russell Russ on that as well. So we'll uh, move on with Russ now. Success with no till under any conditions. And he's been supported by HDB cereals and oils. Thank you. Russ. Thank you, Wallace, Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to open this afternoon's conference. I trust you've all had a good carb fueled lunch. Um, it's fair to say, when I was awarded my scholarship a couple of years ago, uh, I was probably a bit thinner than I am now. The uh, dreaded curse of the Nuffield Stone, or possibly two, has got the better of me. However, I would like to take this opportunity to thank AHDB, Cereals and Oilseeds for their sponsorship. Without their support, I wouldn't have had the fantastic journey I've had. And ironically, along with my expanding waistline, they uh, started out as HGCA two years ago, so they've also changed their name in that time as well. I'd also like to thank the Nuffield Farming Scholarships Trust for making this whole journey possible. It's amazing to think that where we all started two years ago, and we've had some fantastic presentations this morning. However, none of this would have been possible without the support of my fantastic wife, Ellie, who without her support, I probably even wouldn't have applied a couple of years ago. And whilst I've been travelling, she's been the other end of the phone. Um, the internet makes life a lot easier, thanks to FaceTime. With my two wonderful children, um, in brackets sometimes, um, keeping in touch with them is, is always good. But uh, she's been there for me whilst I've spent 12 weeks jetting across the globe to six different countries. And I think it's probably fair to say I probably owe her one or two holidays at the end of this. So, what really got me interested in no-till is we'd had a dry autumn in 2011 on the farm, a wet one in 2012. And what we found in those periods, 2011, moisture was scarce, and so optimising crop establishment with little moisture was interesting. 2012 was the other extreme, the wettest autumn we'd ever experienced. And it was getting moisture away. But the interesting correlation between the harvest at the end of both those two, that performance was on a par with anything we cultivated. And so that got me thinking, well, there's got to be something a bit more in this. You know, how do the best people across the world make no-till work, regardless of whether it's wet, whether it's dry, what do the best do? And coupled with that, and it's whether you choose to buy into this or not, have we really got 100 harvests left in our soils? It's been all over the media recently. There's questions about how we manage our soils. There's no doubt that intensive cultivations aren't improving soil types. And just maybe, no-till might be the way we can look after our, our most precious of resources. So my journey started off in Australia. And the gentleman on my left-hand shoulder here is a guy called Steve Wicks. He farms in the Clare Valley. And when I went to meet him, I could resonate with a lot of what Steve did. Steve wasn't from a farming background. I'm not myself. But the interesting thing with him is he would ask all the questions he could of the best people he could find of how to farm his farm better. Shallow soil over rock, prone to erosion, a real challenge for him. But he found that using no-till was giving him consistent yields. And over that period of time, through using contour banks to reduce the forces of erosion, he was able to farm the farm better. And over that period of time, his yields have stabilised, his soils have stabilised to such an extent that he's getting good year-on-year -year performance. And the legend has it, back in the day of horse-drawn implements, Steve said the ravine that was caused by the erosion was so severe on the farm, they lost two horses and they never got them back. So a great testament to someone who's really farming on marginal soils of how, by using no-till, he's been able to make a living. And then I met this gentleman in the Wimmera region of Australia, in Victoria, Chris Drum is a truly inspirational character. I met a lot of people, but he's up there in my top five of people. I haven't told anyone who's in the top five in case I offend anyone. But his attention to detail was great. And when I met with Chris, I said, yeah, what, what drove you to know deal? What was your key factors? And he spoke about the Melbourne dust storms in the 1980s, losing a couple of millimetres of topsoil. A bad period in the mid-90s, and they realised actually cultivations weren't helping them. So he progressed through the no-till route. 
And over that period of time, using RTK, inter-row planting features quite heavily for him, he would even look at it and say, when it's really dry, I'll plant close to the root ball, the previous crop, because there's just that bit more moisture in there. And he was so fanatical about retaining his stubble height because he was worried about the force of the wind that he staggered the wheels on his planter so they didn't travel in the same wheels as the tractor, so they just came back up again and acting as a comb. And the other fascinating fact, and it came up regardless of country, climate, weather, everyone I spoke to spoke about better water infiltration rates. Not just water draining away, but the ability to hold on to water. And in Chris's words, he said, I want to harvest every single drop of moisture I can. And he was saying over that period of time, the yields have stabilised. I came across people in Argentina who's, who reckon that their no-till crops could hold on for seven to ten days longer than those under a conventional drilled system. We certainly see it over here. The past couple of marches have been very dry and challenging to get crops established. But he was a beacon of excellence in a tricky farming area. And one last thing he said to me, he said, I always cultivate an area of the farm just to remind myself why I never go back. <laughs> this picture here is from deepest southern Brazil, close to the Uruguayan border, uh, Paso Fundo. Some of the most stunning topography I've ever seen. If you've got drops in here, you wouldn't probably know which country in it. It's that stunning and beautiful. But it's beauty with a challenge as well. These rolling hills, when you can get 150 millimetres of rain in an hour, can take soil away very quickly. And then you get the pounding sun, which is drying soil out as well. And this is where I met Nesta Canali, another one in my top five. He's just a fantastic no-till farmer, echoed in his crops. And he said, I invest as much in my cover crops as I do in my main crop. And for him, it was critical to understand that the cover crop wasn't just a thing in between crops. It was part of the whole system. And he would fertilize for it. And he said, you have to view it as your fertilizing, not just for that crop, but for the next one and the next one and the next one. This was echoed in his yields, where he would say, I only get a 10% drop off from our average. He no longer gets the surface crusting associated with cultivation. And again, like Steve Wicks, he used to use contour banks in the early days of no-till, but over that period of time, he no longer needs those contour banks because his yields have stabilised so much and his soil is so more resilient. And organic matter is often spoke about, but is probably one of the key elements about all these people I met wherever I went. Building soil organic matter levels quickly, he was using his cover crops to do this. And the best way I can describe it, you almost have to view it as the duvet, the blanket that protects the soil, helps bind and take nutrients, transport water, a barrier for compaction. And on Nestor's heavy clays here, he felt that as his soil organic mass levels grew, and his levels were up to 5% compared to a regional average of 3, that the inherent stickiness of these soils disappeared as well. Now, it's not to say you can do it all on heavy clays, but it was interesting to bear in mind. And this was reflected when I met Bernardo Romano in Argentina, another fantastic no-till farmer, focused highly on building soil organic mass level and cover crops. He spoke about how his yields have risen by 20% in the eight years he started no-till, his soil organic mass by 25% in the 30 years that he'd been farming. But it came with a health warning, and he was talking about a farm before they really learnt how to no-till properly, where through cultivation they reduced their soil organic mass levels to 3.5% from a base level of 5 within five years. And just so as to show, this resource which the best I came across felt they could build a percent in five years. Others were talking average about 1% in 10. That as slow as it can be to build, it can be eroded very quickly. Echoed by Marlin Richter here in North Dakota as well. And this is one of his cover crops. Huge amounts of organic matter going back into the soil. And the crucial thing for me, and perhaps sometimes one of the biggest mental barriers, is that all of these people saw residue as a friend rather than a foe. Now, compaction was something I was slightly concerned about. It's not this 35-tonne ballasted roll that I came across in New Zealand um, that people were cultivating. We used to squash rocks back into the soil. But it was this. And it came up when I was travelling through Brazil. And when I first came across it, I put it down to sheer scale. Some would argue it's a fault of poor management. But under long-term no-till, and you can probably just make out the roots of this corn crop that cannot find its way through the soil, 10 to 12 centimetres, a compacted area. And it was interesting because the people I came across were concerned about the impacts of their roots not being able to access moisture. Drier periods getting hotter and longer, less distribution of rainfall. The best I came across were acknowledging where they had a problem and choosing to deal with it. Others were choosing to ignore it. But something I feared and was concerned about 
came up with the fact that if you have got compaction, it won't cure itself. Some would choose to use a subsoil to get a quick fix. Others, like Nestor Canali, robust cover crops to use those to punch through. But the basic principle is it should be ignored, shouldn't be ignored and should be looked at carefully. Then New Zealand was a turning point for me as well. Apart from the fact it is when my luggage went missing between Melbourne and Christchurch, I was favoured with the crisis point that I'd have to use the same pair of underpants for two days in a row. It was this no-till crop of peas, and I spoke about rotation when I was in North, Dak North Dakota, but this is perfectly established, no-till peas after grass and went against everything I would expected to do in the UK, where normally we plough and cultivate. But when you took a step back and realised what they were doing, the soil condition is probably in its most per perfect state at this point. And it made perfect sense to me and made me reanalyze what we should be doing. And we talk about rotation, and it's one of the key things in really getting the success with no-till. The days where we've been focused on margin and weed pressure have changed things slightly. But the simplest analogy I can have for it is to think of it like a seesaw. We have a high carbon balanced crop on one side and a low carbon balanced one on the other. And when we talk about high carbon, we're talking about slow breaking down residue. So if you have two crops like that in succession, we take, for example, oats and wheat, possible in the rotation. It can have issues on the following growing crop where you don't mineralize nitrogen through cultivation. And so balancing these properly through a rotation that also reduces your weed and disease pressure is crucial. But something else that came up, and it sounds so simple, but patience is invariably the most priceless commodity, but the most difficult to manage. People that are prepared to wait for the right conditions. Now, patience isn't always something as farmers we're very good at, but it's one of the critical factors in allowing the best to work. Contractors are met who wouldn't go if the conditions were right, waiting for a dry surface crust. Even people in Australia who I met which would seem a fairly arid region, were prepared to wait for the morning dew to disappear before they go planting because the risks of hairpinning were too great. But the other thing as well that came up is that along with patience, the windows of opportunity were far greater with no till than those through cultivation. And this backs up all the reasons of why it should work more successfully. And since my Nuffield, part of the things we've been doing, cover crops feature quite highly for us on the farm. In the autumn, we've been using them ahead of some of our other autumn crops, and we're seeing better water trafficking, better soil condition in the autumn, and ahead of the spring crops, we no longer cultivate anymore. Um, it's a slow process for us. I'd like to change instantly, but we do have a, a minor issue with black grass that we have to pay a little bit of attention to. But the fascinating thing here as well is that uh, the picture in the left-hand side of this screen, I took this two weeks ago, We'd had 27.5 millimetres of rain on this soil in the morning. I walked in in the afternoon, and this is heavy clay. I always told you can't do it on heavy clay, but it backs up everything I'd seen. The improved infiltration rate happens regardless of country and regardless of soil type. So some of my key take-home messages. Without shadow of a doubt, organic matter is a central cog to soil resilience. Compaction can be a very real issue. And you have to think of it as a whole system, not just a machine. The drill's important, but it's a minor cog in a bigger set of gears. And the fact that everyone I came across spoke about greater stability in crop performance, less dips in hollows, in my view, makes no-till potentially the most robust crop establishment system we can use. And if I can leave you with one final message from all my travels, no-till knows no boundaries, and for me, it's a no-brainer. Thank you.